Welcome to Jesus Experience. You are designed to receive from God the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. And through the life of Christ in you, you will live and affect the world around you. Now, here is Dr. Gary V. Whetstone. We thank you, Lord, that you meet all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we trust you, Father, for an open heaven as we take your word. We acknowledge you in all that you've called us to. Not one word fails you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, go ahead and find somebody. Hallelujah. What happened? Did this, my battery die? Glory to God. Okay, we're back on again. All right. Take a look over here with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, which is our text. And then we're going to go to page, I don't know what your page number is, but it's God's purpose explained. We're in the second session of the series we're teaching on, Freedom from Need Domination Through Purpose Motivation. And what we're dealing with is the relationship of need that tries to crush our life. And all of the way in which we react to it, either by trying to mitigate it ourselves or praying like telling God all about it. And then as a result, we find out Jesus said, don't be doing that. He says, don't be likened unto them that think they shall be heard for their much speaking. And then Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, he tells us to pray and say, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And it's not about telling heaven about the problems of earth. And so our whole prayer life can be totally twisted around backwards. And uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, reveals how God has decided his inheritance gets released in our life. It says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, in that text, we understand that God has his fullness of inheritance. We're born again. Peter writes, we're born again to an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven, fades not away. And that all belongs to us, not because we've earned it. We prayed hard enough to get it. We have studied long enough to understand it, but because of our birthright. And so we're going to begin today talking about, in this session, the purpose of God explained and how purpose is so critical because the entire predestinated inheritance is set only according to the purpose of him who works everything after the counsel of his own will. Now, if I settle this fact about all things, either all things are all things, or all things are some things, but all things must be all things. And therefore, God has his purpose and will and orchestration of everything in the counsel of his will touches every arena of life. So I have to know how do I engage with God for that which he has to manifest in my life not how I have been affected by the needs of my life, but how what he raised me to in resurrection, seated me in heavenly places, and how did he connect me to that of inheritance and the will and the kingdom of God from heaven to manifest on earth. So let's look at purpose, because everything is according to the purpose of him who works all things according after the counsel of his own will. Now, according to the purpose. So if I don't understand purpose, I can't coordinate and cooperate in the work of God. That which is revealed, this is the origin of his purpose, is that which has revealed his intention or why he does a certain thing. Now, if I'm going to ask the question why, before I ask what, then I want to know the why of something before I want to know what it is and what it will do. So I'm going to ask God why 
You have everything orchestrated after your purpose and your will. Why? Well, let's take a look at it. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 4, this talks about purchase, purpose rather originating before anything was created. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places, according as he has chosen us in him. When did he choose us in him? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, if I know that before he ever said heaven, before he ever said earth, before he ever said sun, moon, stars, he purposed you to be in him and chose you before the foundation of the world. Now, there's one critical factor that I want you to see in this text, and that is that God lives outside of time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's already lived today, and he's already lived tomorrow, and he's already lived 10,000 years, and he's already lived 10 million years from now. He's eternal. He has no governance on his being of time, but he put time as a regulator in our life. So everything is beautiful in its time. So time is what has a determining factor in us, but it has no determining factor in him. If you read in the scripture, he'll speak a word and fulfill it 300 years later. He's not affected. He'll, he'll give a promise, and people think it's happening today, and it doesn't happen for another 300 years. And it's like, what? I mean, you know, we're not going to get into all that, but the fact is, you and I are in a timeline of God's design. And he orchestrated his inheritance to be released according to his purpose and the orchestration of his will. Now, in verse 9, it says, having, been, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself in whom we have obtained an inheritance, which is the scripture is our text, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, so what did he do? He made known unto us the mystery of his will. Well, how do I know what the mystery of the will of God is? Well, we know the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But that connectivity must really become clear in functionality. Otherwise, I, I don't really know that I know that I'm in the will of God. I don't know that I know that I'm in the purpose of God, but I, I must know it. I mean, I've got to know this. Otherwise, how would I know what I'm going through? God's directly going to direct me in it, or is he going to just keep his eyes closed to it, or is his eyes upon the righteous? Is his steps are my steps ordered of the Lord? Are yours ordered of God? And the steps, can you know what the will of God is? And the answer is yes. It says in Isaiah 46, verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, now listen carefully, he says the things that are not yet done, he calls those things that be not as though they were, he speaks the things that have not happened yet and saying, my counsel or my purpose shall stand and I will do all that I please or I'll, I'll do all my pleasure. So here is God who clearly lives outside of time, put time that you and I would walk in the destiny of the, the path that God called us to, fulfilling his high calling but we need to understand why. If I don't know the why, I don't know what to do. I need to know the why, because why always precedes what. So let's just think about when a manufacturer designs a product and creates it to fulfill a specific purpose, then he builds it, not vice versa. In other words, he doesn't put a hunk of metal together and say, well, what are you? 
He has a design. His purpose, his plan is engaged, and that which he builds is according to why he wants to reach an objective. Whatever that objective is, the why is there. Why we have cars is because there were those before us, and there was a lot of different people that tried all types of inventions to get a horseless carriage, but obviously there was the desire to move humanity from point A to point B without a horse because there's not that many horses. People kept on multiplying, and the reality that there was going to be a capacity to move people in a vehicle that was not drawn by a horse or a donkey or a mule was absolutely unknown about 150 years ago. So here you and I are in a, a relationship with God, and he has the why he's doing what he did so that we get the picture. You never ask the question why to the question what. So think about it. So if I said to a car, why do you exist? It's not going to answer me. It's going to be the person that drives it now. So why did they buy the car? I'm not going to be able to ask the person who originally manufactured a car because there's one thing, and that is the car is going to transport people from A to B. But what if the person in the car says, well, the reason I got this car is I want to drive into a building and crash it. Well, you would call that abuse, wouldn't you? Because the design of the car was not to crash it for a destructive purpose. It was to convey people from point A to point B in a safe dimension. And so consequently, you have a car that now has safety bags and all types of, of collision. The engine drops down to the ground rather than drive back into the, the passenger's lap. And all these things have now been designed into the car because of why they have decided they wanted to protect the people on the inside. You have now what they call a compartment. It, they don't call it a seat anymore. So you, you have a compartment. They're looking to protect everybody in that compartment. And so you've got side airbags and front airbags, and you've got every type of thing designed for a purpose. Everybody say there's a purpose for why it exists. So when the thing created is outside of its intended purpose, you end up with abuse. And I use the example of a knife. And every one of us have these knives in our drawer where it's thick in the back and pointed towards the front and the, the tip is pointed. But we decided one day we we're going to use it to crack, pop open a, a can or to twist a, a screw and the next thing you know, that knife is twisted all over the place. I mean, it, and so what you don't do is when you want to put it out or use it for something that's significant to you, you bypass the knife. And the reason you bypass it is because it's been abused. And any time the purpose of a thing is not known, the only thing that results is abuse. I want you to understand that because you can have wife abuse, you can have sex abuse, you can have verbal abuse, you can have authority abuse, you can have church abuse, you can have abuse in any dimension of life, and consequently, whenever there's abuse, it continues its dysfunction until the purpose of it is known. So next time, the problem is you've got a twisted knife. Now what are you going to do with it? More than likely, you're going to use it until it breaks further because you keep on using the same twisted thing over and over again and consequently keeps on getting worse. So why always precedes the what and when the purpose of the thing is discovered the use of it then follows. Now let's talk about the purpose of the five-fold ministry gifts. The, the people that are given to us to empower us to do the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4 11 and 12. This is why People even come to church. Why you watch online? Why? You know, is it so that you could idolize the person who's speaking? Or is there a God called purpose in that ministry gift? It says he gave some. This is Jesus in his resurrection. Ephesians 4 verse 11. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For or to equip the saints for the perfecting of the saints 
for the work of the ministry. So the purpose is for the equipping or empowering of the saints to do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So a person, I mean, we used an example where an individual had come to church several times and they only came when they were sick. And so, and I wouldn't see them for months and months and months. Then they come back. And so I said to the guy, I said, you know, I said, why do you come here? He said, oh, I come here to get healed. I said, so what do you think the purpose of this church is? He said, oh, it's to heal people like me that get sick so I can go out and do the things I want to get done. I said, well, you know, that's, that's church abuse. I said, God always wants the sick healed. I said, but the purpose you're in church is to do the work of the ministry, to be equipped so you do ministry. He goes, oh, no, that's your job. Your job's to minister. My job's to go out and do whatever I want to do. I said, no, 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 that's not how this works. He said, well, that's how this works. He said, this works my way. You do your thing. You heal me. I get healed. I, I go back out. And when I get sick again, I come back. So we've known that for years. Anyway, so it's called church abuse. Say, how many of you ever met anybody with church abuse? That, that's the person. So let's talk about how provision works. Because what takes place in life is sometimes we, we get so affected by money and we don't know why we're affected by it. Again, Ephesians 1, verse 11, it says, In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So now we've got the picture. His inheritance is predetermined before creation to work according to his purpose after the counsel of his own will. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, now either all things are all things or all things are some things, but God's word says all things, so it must mean how many things? All things. Now, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, it's interesting because I know people that say they love God. And I said, well, okay, that's part of the equation. What about the calling according to his purpose? What is the purpose of your walk on earth? Well, I have no idea. Never really thought about it. I'm just making ends meet. I'm just doing the best I can, but I love the Lord. And I know that all things work together for good in my life. I said, well, there's another part to it. It says, who are the called according to his purpose? He said, well, I don't know that there's a calling on my life. I said, oh, you have a calling on your life. God spoke you before the foundation of the world. God ordained you to fulfill the works he set before you. You're called. Everybody's called. The question is, are we connected to that call? Are we identifying that utterance that spoke us that is eternal into functionality? And are we operating in it? And so looking at this reality and knowing that inheritance is tied directly to purpose and the will of God, I got a sneaky suspicion that the call of God is a critical one, especially that Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus, and I count everything else as dung for the sake of that high calling. And so then everything that was success to him, everything that was failure to him, was nothing compared to the utterance of God that spoke him. And that's the same with you, because you are designed to bring dreams to reality. You're designed to bring what doesn't exist to manifest on the earth. And the only way you do it it's through the will of God, the purpose of God, and your connectivity that's in him. I want you to look over here to Genesis 1, verse 2 and 3. Now, this is after God created the heavens and the earth. And it says, we know that Satan fell, and in his casting out of heaven with a third of the angels, he brought a chaos and a mayhem to the earth. 
it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved or brooded on the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light and saw that it was called it light good. Now, the thing we need to see here is that after Satan had fallen, this darkness and void had become a common place in everything that God had created. It was without purpose. It was in chaos. That's the word darkness and void means. It was in chaos and mayhem. And in that, because of the union with the word of God, the union with the Father, Knowing the purpose of God, the Spirit of God goes into that created world that had turned into mayhem and starts brooding in that atmosphere because it was like the word moved is like the word brood, like a mother hen over an egg that knows that their posterity or their future is in that egg. So that mother hen is sitting on that egg waiting to hatch that egg because it's her future. And so that mother hen's not thinking about this being breakfast. That mother hen's brooding over it because she knows the original intention that that egg was in her was to hatch a chicken. And so she's in it for what the purpose of for that egg. And that's what the mother hen does. That's what the Holy Spirit did because he knew God's original intent and design in that was man in that was the Garden of Eden, in that with all the animals, in that was everything. So we understand something about God, and he had in him everything that was going to occur before it happened, so that it happened on purpose. Everybody say with me, on purpose. So let's ask yourself a question. What would I begin today to do if... The dreams and visions of my heart that God has given me operated, and these several things were just simply provided. Money was not a hindering factor. You had all the finances necessary to accomplish everything going in your heart from God. All the wisdom necessary was freely given to accomplish what I began. That I, I knew that as I began it, I would have the wisdom for every step. It would just be absolutely there, provided without question. That my family, my job, friends all stood up with total support and affirmed their commitment with me. I had no resistance. I had no opposition. I, I didn't have any conflict in the family that this dream that was on the inside was going to take place. The wisdom was going to be there. Finance was going to be there. People needed to bring the vision to pass, cooperating without reserve, and everybody was cooperating. That physically and psychologically, I was also fit that the fear of failure and fainting was banished from my thoughts. I had no consciousness of ever feeling, failing. I had no sense of ever slowing down. I, I couldn't imagine the, the consideration of fainting. It's just gone from my thoughts because... The only thing I have is the purpose that's in me and the dream that's going on inside my spirit. Then finally, I had absolute assurance of heart that what was begun would expeditiously finish. Sounds impossible. Almost sounds like a too good of dream to become true, but it's not. God's purpose is already within you and will undeniably come to pass. Let's examine how. We will, in this session, look at the power of purpose's connection. And we'll get into that in a few minutes here. So our design is to connect to that purpose. Then the next session that I get into will be on the proclamation principle and the penetration principle. But this session, we want to end on the power of purpose's connection. So if I'm not the originator of the purpose. I must hear the originator's intent. I cannot figure it out by what exists. In other words, I can't look at a problem and design a solving of it. 
I need to go to the creator that knew before the problem existed, what is he doing about that issue? You know, all the knowledge is already there. All scientists are doing is discovering it. It's already there. Everything that is known, God already knows. It's just man, in this season of time that we're in, where knowledge is exponentially increasing, we're in that season. And so there's a purpose in that connection. There's a power of purpose connection. Why? God has made you his ambassador. This is the primary functionality of your life and my life. And that is we don't represent us. We represent him. And we must run with his program, not ours. You say, well, all I know is what I had to do in life. I had to go through school, get educated, become somebody in some functionality of a field, earn money, have a family, do the best I can, give to God, worship God, and then go home and meet him. Well, that's not your purpose. God has a higher purpose than a, a routine that becomes just mundane in everyday life. That purpose is your spirit is an offspring of God. Jesus answered in John chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, if I understand that connectivity with God, I understand something about my human spirit, and that is that my spirit is a receiver. It doesn't generate, it receives. My spirit receives. I want you to put your hands on your heart and thank God your born-again human spirit receives. You're designed to receive. You're designed to hear. You're designed to be in union with God. God, I give you praise. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, that there's a union between your spirit and the Holy Spirit. And that connectivity is not what we brought about. It's what he brought about. It says in Proverbs 20, 27, about the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. So, you know, we, we have in, in Romans chapter 8 where it says, what man knows the thoughts of man save the spirit of man that is in him, even so who knows the thoughts of God but the spirit of God. So when we think about that, that dimension, that second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 2, we think about that dimension of re relationship, we have a spirit, that receives from God because it's in union with him. It's the candle of the Lord. It's what God lightens. So your spirit also jointly agrees with God. So I, I can have in me that which attests with God, this is his purpose and his will. L listen carefully. It says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are, Romans 8, 16, the children of God. So I don't need my mind. I don't need my circumstances. I don't need my environment to agree. I need my spirit to bear witness. I need the affirmation of God's authority and purposeful intent to become so much a resolve within because my spirit is in union with him. It receives from him. It's purposed by him. My spirit is eternal. My spirit is not a temporary human spirit. It's an eternal human spirit, just like yours. So you say, well, I got born again on such and such a date. Well, the fact of the matter is that spirit has been eternal before you were ever mortal and human in your physical form because that spirit was from God, lived in God, had the purpose of God, needed a humanity in you when it pleased the Father who separated you from your mother's womb to reveal the Son in him.
All of a sudden, you woke up one day, found out you were on the earth, but you had no idea why until you received him, and that receiving reveals why you ended up on this earth. Now, everything's tied to that purpose. Everything's fulfilled in that purpose. Your spirit does not know any limitations physically. It only believes. The, the, the reality is that your human spirit is pre-designed to only believe God. It does not doubt. It does not question. does not waver. It believes God. And uh, look at Job chapter 32, verse 8. It says, there's a spirit in man, and the inspiration, inspiration is God breathed in life of the Almighty, gives them understanding. So I don't get understanding in my mind. I get understanding by the breath of God, because my spirit is alive to God. And then Luke chapter 18, verse 27, he talks about when you look at the natural world, he talk about what you can do, what you can't do. And he th says, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. So how does this work? My spirit's in union with God. The purpose of God is being revealed. The plan of God is being known. You and I are designed to just reveal what God has purposed, and the purpose of God is to destroy the works of the enemy. So what's the purpose of Jesus? We'll look at that in just a minute. So when we get this, something happened to you. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes. Everybody say, my spirit lives in belief. And it lives in righteousness. I am the righteousness of God. I have no fear, no inferiority, no guilt, no shame, no blame. My spirit is at the right hand of my Father. Here is the voice of God knows the mind of Christ, hears the will of God, fulfills the destiny of God. I have a perfect human spirit. It functions and never fails. And then it says, and with the mouth, which we just did, confession is made unto salvation. Your spirit hears the purpose in the midst of chaos, just like when Genesis 1, 2, everything was chaos and mayhem and destruction, the Spirit of God brooded on the waters, look at Romans 8, 22 through, or 20 through 22. It says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. Now, this is creation. Was subject to what? Subject means brought under the authority of. So what happens? You get all kinds of crazy things released in creation. And they get released in undiscriminate ways, just like this virus thing. And so it's released. So it's subject to vanity, but not, not willingly, but by reason of him that subjected the same in hope. So here's this aimless purposelessness of creation going around everywhere you touch, everywhere you are, and yet on the inside of it, there's an expectation from God that it will fulfill its purpose. Because the creation, the creature, that's also the word creation, itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans, travails, and pain together until now. Why? Because it doesn't know why it's here. It lives in an abuse environment. It creates mutations and dysfunction. It is dysfunctional. And until we, the ambassadors of God, speak the authority of the purpose of God and the will of God. We never invoke the inheritance of God in the earth, and therefore the earth stays in its confused state. 
But tell your neighbor, because of me, I straighten it out. That's what we're designed for. You say, well, I don't feel like I straighten anything out. I, I just kind of feel like I'm being like a ping pong bong, just kind of bounced around in life. Well, that's not your design. Your design is come unto him, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and I'll give you rest for your soul. So here's this relationship with God that's designed you to just settle down in your spirit and just reckon you believe him. You trust him. You know him. He knows you. You're not violating. You're not off course. You're not confused. You're settled. You're stable. You've got a sound mind. You thank God for grace that's prevailing in your life because it's how it is. Just like Genesis 1, 2a, the earth was out form and void and darkness on the face of the deep. The purpose was the spirit of God moved. And what's the spirit of God doing now? He's fulfilling the same intent of Jesus to destroy the works of the enemy. He's fulfilling the same intent of the call of God on your life because that's your purpose. And he's orchestrating everything after the purpose of him according to the counsel of his will. Now, this is going on. This is happening. And the only dimension you have to know it is your spirit. The spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Why? And why did he say light? Why didn't he say, why are you confused? Because you never ask the thing that exists its purpose. You speak purpose into it. 1 John 3, verse 8. Here's the purpose of why Jesus was manifested. He that habitually commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might do what? So what did Jesus do? Destroyed the works of the devil. Well, what were some of the works of the devil? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. What was another work of the devil? Sin. Jesus became sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So that reality became our reality. His purpose is our purpose. So when the enemy is operating, the Spirit of God is operating against him. I'm the agent of God. You're the agent of God. We're connected together with him. And by so doing, we engage that purpose. We step into that will. And then we begin to proclaim. Now, the next session, we'll talk about the proclamation principle. But right now, I want us to stand up before God and thank God that we have a spirit that's from God, and we know his voice, and we know him, and we hear him, and we're supernaturally anointed to function in him. God, I thank you for an open heaven that brings us from glory to glory. God, that takes us out of the enemy's grip and derision of mind and fulfills destiny and purpose. God, our spirit bears witness with your spirit. We're the child of God. I want you to say with me, because you died for me, Jesus, I've repented of sin. Your blood was shed. I refuse the voice of guilt. Shame and blame. I am released from all inferiority. God, I stand in your presence because you raised me in your son without inferiority, equal with you to hear your voice, to know your will, to do it on earth. So God, you and I together give direction to creation. And God, I'll ever give you praise. God, I'll ever give you praise for the great grace that's on my life. In the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to find somebody and tell them you are freed from needs, domination. Through the purpose of God. I know many of you online had to find somebody in your house to say it to. You can be seated. Thank you. God bless. 
As we come to the close of the, the last service of this morning, which is 12 o'clock service, it's almost one here, it's 10 of, we have the awesome privilege of worshiping God with our giving. And I get the, I get the joy of sowing four times this morning and blessing him and honoring him. So on your line, on, but, on your line, there's a button that says donate. Everybody that has an offering envelope, if you're using push pay, you text my VCF to 77977. And we just bless the living God. We never back down or back out or slow down in our giving. We give our way out of every situation in life. And remember, it's through giving that your devourer is rebuked. It's through giving that heaven opens up in your life. Father, I thank you. God, that you open heaven as we worship you. Our first fruit belongs to you. Our tithes are yours. Our harvest is yours. God, you give us seed to sow and bread to eat. And I thank you, Lord. Today we sow the seed to worship you and see the harvest that come from your hands as we magnify you in the matchless name of Jesus. We bless you. Well, if you're giving, you can bring it up here to this little bucket we brought up. I'll put my phone in representing everybody giving on push pay. Hallelujah. Just come on down. We're not going to pass a bucket today because most of you are giving online. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're making out checks, make them out to Victory Giving Cash. Make sure you fill the little boxes there using a bank card. Do the same. And bless the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's just reach our hands out to our giving. Thank God for signs and wonders and breakthroughs. Father, I thank you that seeds are supernatural. That what leaves our hand never leaves our life as we magnify you, God. God, we separate what we sow as holy unto you. Receive from our hands what's a glory to you. And we'll ever give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.